Great. So my name is Dennis Speed, and on behalf of the LaRouche Political Action Committee, I want to welcome everybody here for the Saturday Dialogue with LaRouche. And we have a special presentation that will involve all of you in a campaign that we are about to launch, which will be very uh, exciting. Um, it's a very stimulating campaign. Uh, and in general, you can call it the science of optimism versus the suicide club, otherwise known as the Green New Deal. Um, we issued something which is at our table uh, in the front there called Extinction Rebellion, British Green Fascism to Destroy Industrial Civilization. And we'll be getting into the details of some of what this is referring to, uh, but I think everybody knows that's been following what we've been saying for the past months, that the uh, uh, House of Lords report of the uh, British Parliament of the end of last year uh, explicitly states in a series of sections that it, uh, above all things, uh, regards uh, a second term for Donald Trump as being the end of civilization. Uh, this was reiterated by Prince Charles in a discussion with the Commonwealth Nations a few weeks ago, but they weren't really referring to the politics of that. They're referring to something else. And the something else is what we are caused to expose. And uh, in the time-honored tradition of the LaRouche Political Action Committee and the associates of Linda LaRouche, when we go after doing something like this, we are actually probably the best at the world, in the world. We're really good, really good at taking apart people that we designate as uh, properly the enemies of civilization. And that's what we're about to in, in, in embark on. Uh, but so that we are properly oriented as to why we're doing that and we avoid um, either uh, dead ends or secondary topics or distractions the first thing we're going to do today is to refer to uh, a 10-minute excerpt from a speech given 10 years ago uh, by Lyndon LaRouche, uh, which will give you an idea of what the actual purpose behind what we are attempting to do is. So we're going to play that first, and then we will uh, resume the discussion. That we get certain people in Russia, China, and India, and the United States, as a block of nations around which, which, which combined are sufficiently powerful as a combination to force the needed changes on a planetary level. In other words, by, by net changes, I don't mean jobs. You know, the idea of giving somebody a job to rake leaves is not exactly an economic development program. What we need is production jobs. We need nuclear power. We need a national rail system. We need a space program, a real space program, revived. Because we don't have factories of any, of any significance anymore. We shut them down, especially under George W. Bush Jr. and this thing there. They shut it down. What happened to the automobile industry? What's happened to the aircraft industry? Go all to all the high-tech industries we had. What happened to them? They're gone. We still have the knowledge of that technology, but we are losing the people who are able to practice it. We have jobs, yes. What are jobs worth? Raking leaves? You build a world by raking leaves or doing social work? Mm -hmm. No, you, do, you, you build industries. Today, that means, for example, nuclear power. Technologically, it's impossible to develop the population of this planet without nuclear power on an extensive basis. And that's not enough. What you have to count on is higher energy flux density. You have to increase the energy flux density of the power in the hands of labor. If you can't do that, you cannot achieve the productivity necessary to save this nation and save the world. We, we talk about a vast program of this. We have to go to space. 
We have to undertake the, the industrialization of the moon. Because if we don't do the industrialization of the moon, we can't get to Mars. And if we can't get to Mars, which may take several generations to do that with human beings, we can get there already with the soul craft 300 days or something like that. But if you're going to bring human beings there, you've got to talk about a mere few days between moon orbit and Mars orbit. And that involves some problems. But we shut, pretty much shut down NASA, which was the mission orientation for that sort of thing. Now, the, the Mars project is necessary for humanity. In the, that's in the sense that humanity functions on the basis of something about human beings which animals don't have. The animal world has creativity and the development of species, new species, varieties, and so forth. Even the, the non-living world undergoes development. The universe, the physical universe, is undergoing development all the time. But it has no will to develop. It has no knowledgeable will to choose to develop. It develops because the creativity is built into the universe. Man is different. Man has the willful creativity to shape the universe. And therefore, man cannot function without having the inspiration to use that ability, that creative power, to achieve higher goals than are currently practiced. For example, we have a planet of very poor people, in Asia in particular, in Africa, in ter a terrible mass of, of poor people. We're running short of many resources. We have to create new resources. We have to increase the productive powers of labor of the existing population. We have 6.7 billion people now on this planet. We're headed towards seven. We have to progress to meet that challenge. We have to inspire our people, in their own, each in their own culture, to take this mission orientation for mankind as their responsibility. In order to challenge people, what do you do? Well, you educate them, and you adopt missions which make goals, higher goals, clear to those people. And children say, I want to do this. We had back in the, you know, in the 1960s, even into the beginning of the 70s, you had children who were saying, I want to go into space. The, pro the, the moon landing program of NASA was an inspiration. The Russian Soviet program was also an inspiration to the planet. You have to have these kinds of goals of missions for mankind, for mankind to use his creative powers to raise humanity to a higher level of existence. You have to talk to your children and grandchildren about this kind of goal. And it's only when you get their imagination stirred that they become creative. And without the bestirring that creativity, mankind does not progress. Mm -hmm. And that's what we used to say about the United States. We were a nation that was committed to that sort of thing. What we did under Franklin Roosevelt was an example of a nation which had been crushed under a legacy of Teddy Roosevelt and Wilson and similar types of scoundrels. We were almost destroyed. But we rebuilt, and facing the challenge of the war in Europe and the challenge of unemployment, the challenge is here. We mobilized our people to create a machine, which is the most powerful machine the world had ever seen. The machinery of the United States, which was deployed for World War II. The intention was to continue the development of that machine in the post-war period, not for war purposes, but for construction of the planet. Roosevelt had a clear plan for this thing. Truman had a different idea. Truman kissed the butt of Winston Churchill. And we've been getting the back feet, backlash from that ever since. We destroyed most of our capability. We destroyed our industries. We just shut them down. We had all kinds of projects for post-war projects, which would have led to great achievements. And we shut them down. Nuclear power was one example of this thing. It was feasible in principle. Sometimes it takes you a couple of generations. Once an idea is clear and feasible, it may take you two or three generations to actually bring it online as effective. But the way in which to organize mankind, two questions. First, we have to understand culture. We have to understand national cultures in particular. Because national cultures embody, within the use of language and other things, embody the heritage 
uh, bits of knowledge and experience of, of past generations of that people. Therefore, you cannot go into a country and say you're all, you can't create a, a Tower of Babel, a, a one world economy. You have to use the culture of the various cultures of the people as your mobilizing force. It's because it's in their imagination, which is associated, the powers of imagination associated with their culture, in which they are able to mobilize creativity. So you want to create the opportunity for upgrading them through fostering the benefits of their own creativity and inform them of the objectives that other people are achieving, which they may copy and build upon. So you need a system of sovereign nation states, of sovereign people, different cultures, each with its own sovereign expression, and the unity of these people for a common purpose, the purpose of humanity. To do that, you must have the, must stir the imagination, the powers of the imagination of the people. And if that means reach to space. We're going to Mars. It will probably take us three to four generations to do that, to solve the scientific problems that are involved in overcoming very high uh, speed, speeds of or ex rates of acceleration in interplanetary travel, which is required for moving mankind around. And that's, this is not easy, but we know we can solve the problem. We just have to go through the steps of solving. Take us two or three generations or more, but we'll get there. But as long as we inspire our young people, especially younger people, to, a, to look at their adulthood, you know, we've got a, people in their 20s, they're going to be functioning for, probably for 50 years to come if we can get uh, Obama out of office. He doesn't seem to be in favor of that sort of thing. And they should be looking forward to what they're, what they're going to produce within their own lifetime as benefits for humanity of which they will be proud. It's a span of about 60 years, approximately, that they think into. Most people think that. They live that long. And when people are, can find a purpose in their life, in the sense that what they are doing now, what they are preparing themselves to accomplish, will lead within their own lifetime to the foundations of something much better than they have today. That's when you can capture and sustain the imagination of a people in its own culture. And when people are united, even they have different cultures, if they're united by a common purpose to do this, to cooperate to do this, then we have peace among nations on this planet. And that should be our goal. It should be our goal now. What seems impossible to small-minded people are the ideas that are necessary to get out of the pit we're in today. All right, so that is what we are about. That's what the objective is. This has to be something fought for as a form of a political campaign, and it cannot be attached as such to a presidential campaign per se. It may be included in a presidential campaign. Certainly, we would like to see it included among all the candidates that are going to run for president. But it is something that is independent of that because whomever that president is is also going to leave office. And what we're talking about is something that was uh, a commission of three or four generations of humanity embedded within a concept of policy that's carried out in the immediate, but has to be located in a higher conception of two things, evolution and secondly, economy. Now, the difference between human beings and any other species is the very fact that human beings can think in terms of reproduction cycles. They can think in terms of species also. So for example, humanity is able to consider the reproductive cycles of other species, whereas they don't. Dogs do not consider the reproductive, the reproductive cycles of salmon, for example. Bears, dogs may be interested because they may eat salmon, but they're not interested in how they reproduce. They are interested in how they are consumed, not how they're produced. So the idea here is that in the case of humanity, both in terms of the array of capability that humanity uh, represents in terms of the consideration of species, and also the idea that we're able to think in terms of generations, so that you are not located in your generation. A great mistake 
for example, of that generation now about to expire from the scene of the United States, the baby boomer generation, who unlike uh, the, as was what's called the greatest generation of World War II, whose uh, primary moment was uh, June 6, 1944, and the in invasion of Normandy, uh, with the case of the boomers, their primary uh, event was Woodstock, uh, which uh, is, uh, kind of shows you the difference between the character uh, and the problem involved that we are dealing with is how do we get at what it is that caused that phenomenon. What we're dealing with now, what we are going to have to deal with with respect to the presidency of the United States is that we have to liberate the United States as a whole from the power of the British imperial system. That power is primarily cultural. And so that leaflet I referred to before, Extinction Rebellion, British Green Fascism to Destroy Industrial Civilization, refers to an organization that was created uh, in 2018 uh, in, in, in England. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, handout describes it. I'll just reference um, that the founding declaration of this organization was published in October, signed by 94 academics. Uh, and uh, they uh, state that governments are, quote, guilty of failing to acknowledge that infinite economic growth on a planet with finite resources is non-viable. Well, that itself is a dishonest uh, statement because there is no uh, limit uh, to uh, growth uh, because there is no limit to resources, because resources don't exist as natural resources. There is no such thing as natural resources. So the entire statement is a sophistry. Uh, natural resources are the result of human inventiveness. It is the mind of man and the ability of the mind of man to recognize uh, processes in nature, identify them, discover them, and reproduce them that create what are called resources. Uh, we can give many different examples of that. For example, oil is one such example. It used to be a nuisance for farmers, and it became a resource at the time that the, that of the development of the dreadnoughts and other forms of navy during the 19th century. Uh, you could give a lot of different examples about that. Uh, but, but the idea, there's another element here, which is that there is no reason for the limitation of mankind to this planet. In fact, such an idea would be uh, completely anti-natural because the idea of reproduction, which is done by all species, all life does that, and all life attempts to reproduce in as extensive and intensive a way as it uh, is, inten is, is intended to do, that is seen as instinctive. So to not do that if you're a human being is to go against human instinct, not merely nature. And that's an interesting idea to think about it because, of course, what we are arguing is that the actual nature of humanity is not merely instinctive. It's cognitive, that there's choice involved. But that choice is, poor, is, a, is, is, is a, 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 a natural component of what makes up a human being. Matter of fact, without taking a lot of time on it here, we can get into this in questions. There actually is, uh, 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 strictly speaking, never... Uh, uh, has, has anyone who is a human being ever experienced the natural world, and nor, nor could you ever do so. You can only experience what you call the natural world by means of human cognition and the human sensorium. So you never see the world and never will be able to see the world as long as you're a human being as, quote, it is. It is the way that you experience it as a human being because you are part of it. There is no separation between humanity and nature in the way in which that's been proposed. Just like there's no separation between being on Earth and being in space. You are always in space. You're on a planet that's hurtling through space in a galaxy that's moving at about 2.7 million miles per hour. You don't have any choice about that. So, so there are these things that are said as sophistries, which have... Uh, being utilized by people uh, as a result of the fact that the British educational system that's dominated the United States, particularly since about the 1890s, made sure that people were no longer taught the various schools of rhetoric uh, that 
uh, were you taught them, you would understand what virtually the entirety of your education is composed of, which is rhetoric, various types, sophistries of various types. And in the old uh, educational systems, these used to be taught, whether that f is the cynical form of rhetoric, the sophist form of rhetoric, the Epicurean forms, and so on. These are all illustrated rather well in uh, many of them illustrated in the uh, Julius Caesar by Shakespeare in the scene uh, uh, involving Brutus and Mark Antony uh, and others. That's what the purpose of the scene is, is to show how the mob is manipulated by various forms of rhetoric. The rhetoric of the Stoics, which is what Brutus is using, the rhetoric of the Epicureans, which is what Mark Antony is using. And these are just things that would have been known by the audience of Shakespeare at the time. That's how they would have experienced it, and they would have realized what it was. Cassius is a cynic, and he has a different approach. But that's what they are. And the brief discussion in which Casca refers to the missing Cicero, uh, who is the only person in that play, and of course he's never in the play, that represents anything higher than that impending destruction of Rome, is he says, well, he spoke, it was in Greek, and it was Greek to me. Meaning that the actual conceptions that could have saved that society were no longer comprehensible by the people in the society. And that, of course, is exactly where we're heading right now in America. Let's just take a couple of quick cases just to identify this. Let's take this issue of Russiagate. The purpose of Russiagate, for example, and it's not the only such thing, there are many of these things, is to convince people that snow is black. And it's the same exact thing that the so-called global warming is, that snow is black. That is to say, Russiagate never occurred. The event that was stated to have occurred could not have occurred. And this is what, of course, National Security uh, Agency uh, technician Bill Binney, uh, among others, uh, has revealed, and we've gone through this many, many times, and, and uh, what you saw, for example, in the Mueller hearings was a show which was being put on, and, and it involved both sides. Matter of fact, it involved everyone who did not state there was never such a thing as a Russian hack. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody that stated anything in the Mueller hearings intended to fraud the American people and themselves. That I didn't say that. I simply stated that the fact that it never occurred, and it did not occur to anyone who spoke to point out that it had never occurred, is equivalent to the tragedy of Rome as expressed by William Shakespeare in Julius Caesar, which was his own comment on Queen Elizabeth, which was the purpose of the play, Julius Caesar. There is no such thing as entertainment in William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare and his plays are the most, some of the most polemical and political things ever written. That's one of the reasons why when you remove them from the historical context, you castrate them. And uh, that's why you get so many bad performances, by the way, by so many bad actors. Uh, they have no idea what the content of the play is. And as a consequence, they can't uh, uh, carry it off. They can do something else, which has very little to do with William Shakespeare and everything to do with Sir Lawrence Olivier, for example. So. Uh, I'm saying this because I want to set up and say a few things about what it is we need done, and I want to do this as, as efficiently as I can, but I want to apologize from the beginning because I'm going to be throwing a few things out here which are really intended as uh, areas of investigation that we ourselves have to do. But the way that we do these things so that this is clear is that we are a non-academic organization. What we do is we take apart uh, falsehoods. We destroy idols. We are iconoclasts. And we don't allow for, hmm? we sort of uh, do it the way that Gideon did it. You've heard of Gideon's army. People talk about the 300 people of Gideon's army and how they uh, defeated uh, the Midianites. Uh, how God wouldn't allow Gideon to take the thousands of people that he had with him. And he came up with different tests. He said, you got too many people. I don't want you to have all those people. You got to get, I just want a few people that I know are the right people. 
But Gideon first qualified himself for that job by destroying the idols of the Midianites one night. And he hid afterwards in his father's tent, but the relevant element is that he understood that the first thing that you have to do if you want to actually qualify as a leader is you must destroy the idols. This is a crucial idea because when you're dealing with the British crown, when you're dealing with Prince Charles, you were dealing with a pagan force. You are not dealing with anything which is Christian. In fact, you can't even strictly call, uh, speaking call it satanic. Because as, as uh, the real pagans will tell you, particularly the feminists, Satan was a man. They're not worshiping Satan. They're pre-satanic. And the thing that you're dealing with with Philip is something which is pre-satanic. It's, it's the druidical cults that have been, uh, you know, uh, seen in various movies like The Wicker Man of 1973 and are seen at places like Burning Man in Nevada. And I reference Burning Man here because this is relevant to something that you'll see if you go onto the internet. There's a, there's a sensation of the past week or week and a half, which is supposed to be, it's a, it's a documentary called The Great Hack. And what the documentary is, is intended to do is to justify the idea of the Russian hack based on the notion that a set of people involving this particular individual, Brittany Kaiser, working with Cambridge Analytica, were responsible for the election of Donald Trump. See, that, that's what the thing, that's what it's about, right? Okay, now this is what we call a bamboozle. Those of you who've been to our forums here know we use this term all the time about being bamboozled and took and flim-flammed hmm, and so forth. And this is what this is. So what this is involved and intended to do is to, uh, is to cover up the story that we've been telling for two years. It's all in our various uh, material and which became necessary to tell once it was clear that Robert Mueller would end up inevitably testifying. So, so once it was clear that he wasn't going to get out of that, this documentary and other such things begin to be shaped and make sure and these things appear because the Russiagate process was known that it was going to run out of steam as soon as Mueller got in front of a camera because it was known that Mueller uh, is Mueller. That is the people that actually understood it as opposed to the flim flam that the American people had gotten about the brilliant prosecutor and the incisive mind of Robert Mueller. Those, uh, those who knew him knew he was a poor hack. He was not very intelligent. He hadn't done the investigation. In fact, there had been no investigation. And so what happened was that this came in front of the American people. So they knew this was going to happen, so they had to get ready and roll something else out. So now they got nothing, something else out there for you. And we're not going to spend a lot of time, but the reason I bring this up, this woman, Brittany Kaiser, is, is uh, featured in the, uh, in the documentary. I want to say a little bit about her quickly. Uh, this is just from the famous, you know, Wikipedia page. Originates from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, attended the University of Edinburgh to undertake a master's in international relations. Uh, she got interested because she volunteered on Hi Howard Dean's 2004 presidential campaign. Got an internship back in Chicago to work on Barack Obama's presidential campaign. Uh, work worked on the social media team for that then went back to University of London. I got an LLM degree in human rights, then a PhD in international law and diplomacy, so forth and so on. Now, I'm referencing her because she is said to be in the documentary, The Great Hack, sort of the key whistleblower on what was being done through Cambridge Analytica to give the election to Donald Trump. But that's not why I'm telling you about her. I'm telling you about her because if you go and look at this documentary, which is up on, uh, uh, Netflix, you'll see that the opening scene takes place at Burning Man. And what it shows is this, uh, and this is just from an article that appears, you can just Google and you'll see this article. You might notice that when the documentary opens, we see Brittany Kaiser, a key figure in the documentary, at an event somewhere setting a large wooden structure on fire. Where is she and what is happening? In that opening scene in The Great Hack is 
uh, uh, Kaiser is signing a wooden structure and they, uh, later watching as it's set on fire. This is taking place at Burning Man. So what is this? Okay, Burning Man is an annual event taking place in a temporary city set up in the Black Rock Desert of Nevada. The event is held every summer. The main focus is burning a wooden effigy called The Man. The theme for Burning Man in 2018, when that scene was filmed, was called I, Robot, and more than 70,000 people participated. Uh, although the burning of the man is traditionally known as the focal point of the evening, the burning of a temple is also a big focus, too. Participants write personal messages on the temple before it's burned. We see Kaiser inscribing Cambridge Analytica on the temple in the opening scene from 2018 so forth, and I could tell you more. Now, w this is just it brought in here because there's one th basic thing we're going to make to all of this to you and what we're saying. There is no science in global warming, as in none, as in zero, as in everybody that is claiming that who is a scientist is a fraud. Now, there are people who are claiming it who are generally scared out of their minds, and there's a lot of people doing that, and they generally believe it, and that, those people I am not uh, talking about. But if you take someone like Stuart Brand or Michael Ellenberger to Lee, or Patrick Moore, all three of whom are major environmentalist figures from uh, you know, the days of the, in the case of Brand, of course, he's the whole Earth catalog. I mean, he is the quintessential environmentalist. He's somebody that people, I had the whole Earth catalog. Stuart Brand was the person that I first looked at when I was first getting involved at that time in environmentalism. So, I, I mean, he's a hero to various people from that time. Uh, or Patrick Moore, who was the rainbow warrior. He was one of the first people to ram a vessel to try to stop the, the, the whole whaling business. These guys who believe in global warming are saying, if you believe in global warming, you have no choice except to accept the idea that nuclear power is the only way that you can create clean energy that can end carbon emissions or can, or can curtail carbon emissions. That's what they say. And they keep saying, we don't understand why our friends, or used to be friends, keep arguing with us that we somehow betrayed the environmentalist movement because what we're trying to actually do is resolve the problem of how we get clean energy. And the fact of the matter is that you get a, a smaller carbon footprint from nuclear power than you get with solar panels, which Michael Ellenberger thoroughly documents and goes through in his documentary. Now, we don't believe in this. This is not us. This is not our view. See? But these are people who, with whom Though we might have severe disagreement, they're honest enough to make the point that if we're really interested in trying to stop this catastrophe, we must use nuclear power. They're not even saying thermonuclear fusion, which was our organization's position from 1974, actually 73, 74. Lyndon LaRouche was the one that uh, introduced us to that and that we began to talk about that from that time. So that's what they say. But the reason that they don't understand why their friends don't agree with them is what they don't understand is that it ain't about global warming. It ain't about climate change. None of this is about that. It is about one thing and one thing only, reducing the population of the globe to less than a billion people. It's about what it was about in the 1930s, and it's the same people. <coughs> no, not the Germans. Not the Germans. Bertrand Russell, H.G. Wells, Montague Norman, the Bank of England, that's who it is. That's who it always was. Those are the people that financed Hitler. Those are the people that created fascism. That doesn't mean there weren't people in Germany that weren't fascists, as there were people in Italy and Paris, France, and Jersey City who were fascists. I didn't say there weren't people that didn't agree with them. But the origin of this is from the skirts of the British Queen. So what we're going to do is we're not going to play any games with this. We're going to go after this. Now, it didn't actually originate with the British alone because the British themselves in succession represented something called the Venetian Republic. And that in turn represented Rome and that in turn represented uh, the old myth 
of Zeus versus Prometheus. And Jason can tell you about that. He wrote about that, and other people wrote about that extensively in various of our uh, magazines, um, 21st Century and so forth. And we will get into that in questions and answers. But I, I'm, I'm not interested in trying to uh, do a lot of, of detail. I think it would be wrong. And I think after what you heard from Mr. LaRouche, which is the actual perspective for what we're going to do, the Four Powers Agreement, which Donald Trump, since he is President of the United States, is going to have to lead. So whatever you think of Donald Trump, however you have problems with him, and if you agree that he may sometimes do things that are completely, shall we say, uh, provocative in the wrong way, okay? even if we, this is the case, he's the President of the United States right now, and this deal has to be made now. Why? Why does it have to be done now? We're in a situation where sometime over the course of the next couple of years, unless there is something done uh, to prevent it by eliminating or creating conditions for eliminating several billion people from the planet, the present financial system must be collapsed. Let me repeat that. It must be collapsed. Now, that doesn't mean that we wish to collapse it to bring about some sort of financial holocaust. No, that would be irresponsible. It doesn't mean, oh, well, because we believe in some new system, we want to see human suffering. No, we're saying that because of the quadrillions of dollars of indebtedness, which is basically completely fictitious, there has to be a reorganization of that paper. And you have to use Hamiltonian financial methods to do that. There is a way to do that in an orderly first fashion, relatively. Um, and, and you can stop people from dying. Uh, but because it wasn't done in 2008, uh, it's, it's, more, it's more complicated now. The Paris Accords, the Paris uh, uh, Conference on Climate Change was not about climate. It was about creating uh, the basis for a combination of figures whose names will become familiar with to you. Christine Lagarde, you've heard of. There's a woman named, I think, is it Christine Thiemann or something like that? There's a few other names that we'll be going through. I want to try to abbreviate right now. But we had, there was something, yes, Christiane, I'm sorry, Christian, Christian Thiemann. Uh, this is not a, a lady, but this, I don't think. But this is a former AXA manager. That's one of the largest insurance companies in the world, headquarters in, headquartered in France. Past advisor to the U EU Commission and to the European Central Bank. And what happened was, uh, this, a speech was given uh, at the House of Finance in Frankfurt, July 27th. And Thiemann said, if you read uh, the Paris Agreement from the climate change, suddenly in Article 2, the financial sector is being mentioned. It was an issue for ecologists, industrialists, scientists, and suddenly in the, 20, in the 21st century, you have a remark, 21st year, you have a remarkable sentence about finances. It says the following. The climate targets will only be achieved if we start to reorient capital flows toward a low emission world. This is now a process that is going on where the European Commission is asking experts from the private sector, can you please tell us how we would do that? And this is the program that the Commission has been working on for two years, uh, which is now cast into law. And then he goes on, they go on and talk about the, uh, the Extinction Rebellion, which is the thing in this, pen, in this leaflet. Uh, and, and he then says, and then come the political lessons uh, that 12 million young people f appear on the streets and suddenly you have this big topic going. So, so what's relevant there, and there are other examples that we could give. There was just a conference in Dortmund, Germany, I think over this, this, this weekend, uh, where uh, major officials from the uh, German go uh, government, CDU and other uh, organizations, other parties spoke. Uh, so what's happening is what happened in the period of the 1920s. You get a meeting between the street and the banks, and there's a convergence on a policy. And the policy involves the necessary elimination of the unfit, of the redundant, of those persons who live lives not worthy to be lived. And a lot of those people are you. So that is what is now uh, underway. Now that doesn't mean that that's about the triumph. That means that that's the actual name of the actual enemy. 
uh, which is what has been assembled or is being assembled as a form of suicide club. Uh, and um, we're not uh, going to uh, uh, mince words with, about this. We're going to tell the actual story. We're going to tell that story within the confines of the fact that there's a space program now announced to go back to the moon in 2024, to go to Mars. There is a program for the development of thermonuclear fusion, at least the advocacy of that, from Vladimir Putin as of July 9th which is the first time any major head of state, to the best of my knowledge, has spoken to something like that in that way, as his way of talking about a proposal to end the kind of cultural pessimism and despair around climate change. Uh, and, of course, there is the work being done in China, uh, also in India, on space uh, in collaboration, and the idea that there could be a form of uh, strategic defense of the Earth, involving all the nations who are space uh, nations and those that wish to become space nations, so that there's a shared mission for mankind as a whole. To protect the Earth from asteroids, yes, but to also explore uh, those prospects for, for transforming the entire economic platform of the planet. The reason we would do this, the idea of doing this, the notion of doing this, is that human evolution is a shift in the character of evolution in the universe as a whole. Species prior to mankind, to the best of our knowledge, at least in our part of the universe, they evolved by some physical or physiological extension or improvement or change that they underwent. They may have grown feathers, they may have grown claws, they may have gotten shorter or, long or taller, uh, they may have reconfigured their bodies in different ways, but that's how they did it. Mankind doesn't do that. Mankind does not have to grow new limbs. What, it, what mankind does is by means of the power of cognition and creativity and imagination, it changes and extends its sensorium in other ways so that the spacecraft that are now hurtling past the solar system in the course of the case of Voyager are our hands and eyes and feet and ears. And that's the way in which we undergo evolution. That's a change in universal evolution because it allows for the promotion of and the extension of other animal species that can't do that to other parts of the solar system. So there's life that's either replaced where it used to be or placed where it never was. So this isn't being done just on behalf of humanity. This is being done on behalf of the universe. And the notion that you stand opposed to that means that you stand in the way of the evolution of the universe itself. And that is the purpose of Charles's idea. That is the purpose of what these people are proposing about shutting down science and shutting down ideas and shutting down the human mind. We're not going to let that happen. What we want to do is we want to give you uh, a more in-depth picture of both what this involves from an epistemological standpoint, but also just in terms of how to think about uh, having the, the equipment, the, the intellectual equipment, to know uh, how this process came about and what we intend to do about it. And so to do that, I want to have Jason Ross, uh, who has been uh, very involved in this, both as the former editor of 21st Century Science and Technology and otherwise as a member of LaRouche's basement team to come and tell us what we need to know. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Hey, everybody. Uh, I want to start, I'm going to read uh, two paragraphs from Lyndon LaRouche from a paper that he wrote in 1988 about the huge paybacks that would come from colonizing Mars. He writes, is it not a very good thing to close one's eyes on the last moment of one's mortal life, knowing that one's great-great-grandchildren will have good reasons to smile on the memory of your life? Is it not a very good thing to be able to live one's life during the decades before one's death, even during adolescent preparations for adult life, knowing that the work which one is assisting is leading to a happy thought about one's entire life at the moment of death. 
For what other purpose do we bring children and grandchildren into this world and nurture the development of their moral character and intellectual powers? If we are wise about living this mortal life, do we not reflect upon the debt we owe to generations before us? Many generations. Do we not reflect upon the fact that after our life is ended, those who come after us will benefit from what we have contributed to the development of the moral character and intellectual powers of our children and grandchildren. Young people today, I don't believe, are being given an excellent foundation in development of moral character or of intellectual powers. As a matter of fact, many of them are being trained to commit suicide or homicide suicide. Why just take yourself out when you can take other people out with you? This is the creation of a death movement, and that's what I'm going to counterpose to where we ought to be going. So let's uh, get these pictures up here. Okay. Yeah. So Dennis gave a, an overview of what's going on in the world, so I'm not going to repeat that except to, to stress one, one particular aspect of it, which is that a new paradigm is taking place in the world right now. Since the 2013 launch of the Belt and Road Initiative by China's President Xi Jinping, an initiative that is very much in accord with the proposals of Lyndon LaRouche, Helga LaRouche, the Schiller Institute for many decades, the world is increasingly oh, being alien offered rights. Maybe it would fall under the category of cultural vandalism, an act that's not necessarily illegal, but is a giant bummer to the rest of humanity. This is... <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so people are being presented an alternative. Parts of the world that have not developed in the past 50 years. Think about it. In most of the world, colonialism ended during the 1960s, the colonialism that still existed in its official form. The development that should have occurred largely has not. And now there's finally an option to make it happen. There's a new paradigm. That is not something that the British are happy about. And to prevent that, we saw Russiagate, the fraud of Russiagate, the hoax of Russiagate, the non-existing Russiagate, uh, as Dennis put it. We've seen attacks on China as well, including on Chinese people in the United States, Chinese Americans, the Confucius Institutes, people saying that having a Chinese employee in your company probably means they're a spy for Xi Jinping, uh, essentially racism, in an attack on this broader shift in the world. So let's look at what their last, what seems to be the last alternative to try to stop this from occurring is. The Black Death swept Europe in the 14th century, killing 100 million, 200 million people. In many areas, the population did not retain its level before the Black Death. It took two centuries to restore the lives that were lost. Worldwide, several hundred million people died because of this disease. People have perhaps heard the story by Edgar Allan Poe of the Red Death, which is a story about people, well-off people, trying to ignore the conditions of plague surrounding them. People who say that they're going to escape it all, they're going to just enjoy life, and they're not going to worry about the outside world. The outside world finds them. The Red Death finds them. Today, the death takes a slightly different color. It's the Green Death. And in this case, unlike pus-filled sores, which are obviously bad. This one looks kind of nice, depending on how you look at it. Seeing kids going out, you know, wanting to change the world, seeing a young woman, Greta Thunberg, up here, who, um, it's just a coincidence that she looks like she wishes we were all dead. She um, <laughs> actually does think that, I believe. But this is a new form of, of death. It's a suicide death. It is based on the idea that fundamentally the human species does not belong, that we should not exist, and that there is something meaningful called natural that we, by any of our actions, are destroying. Think about that funny idea for a minute. Think about, don't want to be so leading, think about that idea for a minute. The idea of a natural world. Without people, 
how do you gauge whether a certain type of environment is good or bad? In other words, what makes a desert so good? There's not a lot of life in it. Is it good just because it already exists? If you believe that, then any change that we make is inherently bad just because we did it. If you think that, you are saying that human beings and human activity is fundamentally evil, and it would be great if we could eliminate it altogether. What's the best way to do that? Is it to replace straws at Starbucks, or is it to kill everybody? It's to kill everybody. The Extinction Rebellion, which is a kind of a funny name. Um, you would think, based on its name, uh, I take that to mean that it's a rebellion calling for human extinction. Supposedly, it's a group rebelling against our extinction. Here's a group of them um, claiming to superglue themselves to the entryway at the Energy Ministry in London. This is October or November 2018. This is when this group emerged full-formed from the head of someone in England. This is the, uh, the head of it, Gail Bradbrook, one of the founders. Here she is pretending to have her hand super glued to the door here. Um, she was pretending. And here she is painting a big sign up on top, frack off, she says. This group is calling for a move in the world to zero net CO2 emissions by 2025. That's six years from now. The only way you could possibly achieve that would essentially be to kill every person on the planet. I'm not uh, exaggerating here. That would be the only way to achieve that. Greta Thunberg. People, have people heard of her? Is this an unknown person? Okay, she, well, she's a, um, she's a victim of child abuse, which is sad. And she is uh, unfortunately being used to adopt the role of a young Joan of Arc for the modern era. She's Swedish. She started skipping school on Fridays to protest, saying, why should I bother going to school and learning things when the whole world is going to end anyway? We need to make our number one priority saving the planet because the human species is about to go extinct. And she has been sharing her message of love and joy with the world for several years around this. Um, here she is with some of her friends who had similar outlooks on things. You may recognize some of them. Any of these people look familiar? Really? No? Oh, wow. I'm feeling old. Okay. Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech. Sandy Hook. Hail Bop. Heaven's Gate. Suicide Cult. Anyway, these are some of her buddies. So, you know, with the, you know they're, all, they're hanging out, and they've got this idea of uh, environmentalism. Now, let's talk about where environmentalism comes from, because some things that really shouldn't have to be stated, we can just say them. Is it good to have clean water? Yes, it's very nice to be able to swim in a river and not get a disease, of course. Is it good to have air that you can breathe without having bad health effects? Of course, that is a good thing and pollution should be addressed. The air in major cities in China is dirty. That should be cleaned up. That's not what modern environmentalism is about. Those things, of course, make sense. Environmentalism was created by the British as an attack against humanity. The World Wildlife Fund, for example, or the World Wide Fund for Nature, this was founded in the late 60s by Prince Philip, the old crusty thing that's uh, married to the queen, by the uh, Nazi Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, the Nazi, not exaggerating, and uh, Sir Julian Huxley. This was created as a British project at the same time that colonialism was being defeated and overthrown around the world in the, late 19, in the 1960s, particularly by the late 1960s, in order to prevent the growth of those colonies. Environmentalism came on the scene. So countries now are told, oh, you'd like to develop, you'd like to get out of poverty, you'd like to provide energy for your people? Well, I'm sorry, but you cannot build a coal power plant because it would be bad for CO2 emissions. You're just going to have to die. That's the friendly face of environmentalism today, and it was created um, in that way. 1989. Let's jump ahead a little bit to talk about some stuff about global warming or climate change or whatever, climate catastrophe, climate chaos, whatever words people want to use for this uh, today or maybe next month it'll be different. Here's Steven Schneider. And here's something he pointed out in Discover in 1989. 
On the one hand, he wrote, as scientists, we are ethically bound to the scientific method, in effect, promising to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but. On the other hand, we are not just scientists, but human beings as well. We need to get some broad-based support to capture the public's imagination. That, of course, entails getting loads of media coverage. So we have to offer up scary scenarios. We have to make simplified, dramatic statements and make little mention of any doubts we might have. This double ethical bind we find ourselves in cannot be solved by any formula. Each of us has to decide what the right balance is between being effective and being honest. Have you ever known somebody, or perhaps yourself, when you have got in mind the way things ought to be, that you've said something that you knew not to be true, to try to make a case for something that you think is very big and important, and you may have fibbed along the way because you believe that final goal is really important? It, this happens pretty frequently. Okay? This is what this guy is mentioning. So let's take a look at some of, the, uh, some of the claims that we're hearing more recently about the climate and about the catastrophe supposedly upon us. Here's Mustafa Talba, the executive director of the UN Environmental Program. He says, the world faces an ecological disaster as final as nuclear war unless governments act now. Without action, the future will bring, by the turn of the century, an environmental catastrophe which will witness devastation as complete, as irreversible as any nuclear holocaust. Did anybody remember hearing him make this remark on May 11th? It wasn't in the new, it was because it was 1982. <laughs> 1982, okay. By the turn of the century, an environmental catastrophe which will witness devastation as complete, as irreversible as any nuclear holocaust. Maybe he was just a little bit off though. Let's, you know, I'm sorry. Here's Noel Brown, the New York director of the UN Environmental Program. A senior UN environmental official says entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if the global warming trend is not reversed within 12 years. Coastal flooding and crop failures would create an exodus of eco-refugees, threatening political chaos. 12 years, people remember hearing about this recently? Kind of a famous wild lady around here said this, I believe. Well, she's a little late on the scene because this guy said we had 12 years in 89, okay? I think you can kind of guess what's going to be coming up with these next slides. So uh, I just put the year up there. If there's no action before 2012, we're too late, he said in 2007. I guess it's just too late, isn't it? Here we have our magic eight ball, Prince Charles. He says in March of 2009, we have less than 100 months to alter our behavior before we risk catastrophic climate change. We may yet be able to prevail and thereby avoid bequeathing a poisoned chalice to our children and grandchildren. But we only have 100 months to act. Now, some people would say that a man who plays dress up and takes pictures like this as an adult without feeling embarrassed about himself <laughs> and who lives in several castles would be out of touch with the population. But he's got his pulse. He's got his finger on the pulse of the people. That's why he used the easy to relate to image of having a chalice, which we all have at home, and of bequeathing it. <laughs> Does anyone in this room have enough money to bequeath things to the next? I mean, you gotta have a lot of money to bequeath, okay? So 100 months, let's get our, our math quiz here. 100 months from March 2009. When, when does that? Eight years. Eight years and a few months, right? So that would be 20, so that already happened. Oh no, we, we have the poison chalice, it's too late. Let's shake him up and see what he says the next time. The grim reality is that our planet has reached a point of crisis and we have only seven years before we lose the levers of control. Hmm, okay, let's shake them up and see what comes up in 2010. Ladies and gentlemen, we, only, we now have only 86 months left before we reach the tipping point. 2014, we are running out of time. How many times have I found myself saying this over recent years? Why is nobody listening to me? His Royal Highness warns that we have just 35 years to save the planet from catastrophic climate change. And just this July, what did he say? 
Ladies and gentlemen, I am firmly of the view that the next 18 months will decide our ability to keep climate change to survivable levels and to restore nature to the equilibrium we need for our survival. Where are these numbers coming from? Okay. Now, you might say this is just Prince Charles. Who is he? Well, um, yeah. This isn't out of, the, uh, out of the ordinary here. So what we've got is, this is, it, it's just ridiculous. I, I actually had some slides I was gonna go through about this, but I'm just not even really gonna, it's just not worth it. But look, here's, a, here's supposedly where temperatures, you know, would, so here we are, 2019 or whatever. This, this chart was made, I'm sorry, a few years back, but um, you can see where the supposed temperature is versus all the, uh, I'm sorry, the supposed temperature versus what it really is. These people have been making these predictions for years, and it just hasn't been happening, okay? In 1999, the temperature in the U.S. was presented as moving along this curve. In 2006, the same data was presented as looking like this. So, although there was a decrease in temperature by the year 2000 as printed in 1999, when the same data was printed in 2006, they said the temperature actually increased. So there is man-made global warming. You see it right here, <laughs> right here. You just go in Excel and you make it. It's no, it's no problem. It's very easy. So this climate stuff is, uh, it's, it's a suicide call. You know, it, it takes all these images. One of the things about to, to build up these movements like this, where you get people to glue themselves or pretend to glue themselves to things and put on um, fake spray paint. It's spray on chalk. That wasn't spray paint, so they don't want, they want to look good, but they don't want a big prison sentence. So if it's spray on chalk, you get out in a couple days. Very smart of them. It's to present everything as a simple good or bad. So instead of talking about understanding of the world climate, it becomes as simple as do you believe in it or not? Almost like someone saying, a kid asking another one on the way to school, do you believe in Santa Claus or not? Or somebody perhaps asking themselves if they believe in God or not. And so you get the simple thing, do you believe in global warming or not? Do you believe in climate change or not? This isn't a kind of a yes or no thing. You can believe that human beings have some impact on the world's climate, which I do. I mean, I couldn't imagine we have zero impact, duh. But the idea that it's a catastrophic thing, that we're going to lose the levers of control in some number of years, these are very specific claims. And so you shouldn't say whether you believe or not, yes or no, something that specific and catastrophic. So let's talk instead about where we're going to go and what the wonderful future will be if we do not commit suicide. The reason, though, that this suicide is being pushed, I got to say, this is being very effective, actually, because that creepy girl, the um, yeah, Greta, yeah. She's been having a lot of success in promoting her message. It's kind of amazing that a little school girl on the street outside the Swedish parliament, you know, some plucky heroine like this, is invited to the European parliament, the French parliament, the British parliament. She's meeting with Angela Merkel. She's on her way, I believe she's on a sailboat now, coming to the US to offer us her wisdom. Why get picked up so easily? So what, what is happening is this is having a major effect specifically in, uh, in Europe already, where there's major green policies, where Europe is aiming to outdo itself country to country, to shut down CO2 emissions, to be climate neutral, and so on and so forth, to not allow investment in energy unless it's for a windmill or something like this. This is going to make it impossible to develop. Let's talk about what real development will look like. So in order to build a future, let's take just a moment to think about what uh, makes human beings human beings. Here's a chart of human population growth. It ends at the year 2000. We've grown, of course, since then. As Dennis mentioned, unlike any other species, well, we're unlike any other species. No other species does this. If you had a chart of mammal population growth, over evolutionary time, with the rise of mammals, you might see a rise like this. That could sure happen. If you had a chart of the amount of life on land, with the move from the seas to the land, you might see a chart like this over evolutionary time. But over a few thousand years, for one species, we're embodying as one humanity a principle 
that exists in the biosphere over millions of years, that exists in the universe over billions of years, creative development. We make this happen because we figure out how nature works. Because guess what? We're not outsiders. There's something that our mind has in common with all of the universe that lets these things that we have called thoughts have a greater power than an earthquake or a volcano. Those thoughts, those things you carry around in your mind that don't even weigh anything, they're the most powerful thing we know of. Wow, that's the human species. I'm going to leave, this is a long quote. Well, I'm not going to introduce this man. I'm simply going to say his name and read this very appropriate quote. This is Vladimir Vernadsky. He wrote in the first half of the 1900s, there exists now on the terrestrial surface a great geological force, perhaps cosmic. This force does not seem to be a new manifestation or special form of energy, nor yet a pure and simple expression of known energy. But it exerts a profound and powerful influence on the course of energetic phenomena on the Earth's surface, and consequently has repercussions, smaller but undeniable, beyond the surface, on the existence of the planet itself. This force is human reason, the directed and controlled will of social man. Let's use this thought in conjunction with the economic metric used by Lyndon LaRouche, energy flux density, to talk about what some of the conditions are going to have to be for our sustained growth and improvement. First, just a historical chart. The amount of energy used per person over the history of the United States. We used to use wood. We used to use, you know, coal replace wood. Oil and natural gas have supplanted coal. Fusion I'm sorry, fission, nuclear fission, got a little bit of a start, but then it really didn't. Energy use per person in the US peaked in the 1970s. This isn't because we invented fluorescent light bulbs. What do we not do that much of now compared to what we did in the 1970s that uses a lot of energy? Hmm? Making things, yes. That's a great way to save energy, just shut down. Don't make anything. Hey, hey, look at that. So what this reflects isn't efficiency, this reflects a decision to not be productive, to shift more and more towards finance instead of manufacturing or industry or advanced agriculture. Although, of course, we've had advancements in these things, but not as a major focus of the US economy. Nuclear fusion is the next energy source for the future. In 1978, the Department of Energy worked out a blueprint for how different funding levels for nuclear fusion could help us achieve fusion by different years. Obviously, this is an estimate. And in 1978, this magenta line was an amount of funding that was estimated at that time to keep projects moving and keep research kind of going, but never really make the breakthrough. If Kennedy had said that we were going to the moon by the time the century was out, instead of by the time the decade was out, if we set our sights on a slow path to the moon, we might not have ever gotten there by 2000, if there wasn't an intent to really make it happen. So what we've had is nuclear fusion. The actual funding is that black line. Here's another chart. If we compare annual funding for a few different, and this is all adjusted for inflation and all that kind of thing. So the Apollo program, going to the moon, we can see here yearly $7 billion spent on this. The Manhattan Project to develop an understanding of the nucleus in a race against the perceived threat of the Axis developing a nuclear bomb, over $4 billion a year. Fusion. The highest cost estimate in 1978 was similar to what it cost to power the Manhattan Project. The, the level at which fusion would never be achieved is the gray bar, and the blue one all the way on the left, that's what we've actually been spending on average. 
to research nuclear fusion. I want to put this in a little bit more perspective. Let's look at total funding. So again, we've got the Manhattan Project. It was quick. So it cost a lot, but it was done. Okay? We've got the, these different fusion crash programs, depending on how quickly we intended to make it, how rapid the investment was. Maybe 50 billion was the estimate in 1978 in, in today's dollars. The Apollo program cost maybe almost $100 billion. Let's look at one more. Oh. Let's zoom out. Okay. That's how much was spent last year on renewables. In one year. One year. So compare those orange, that orange line. That, would have, that was the total estimated cost to develop nuclear fusion energy. Compared to that orange total cost, the average cost, that tiny blue thing on the left is what we actually spend. So you barely even see it on this chart compared to renewables in one year. At this point, last year, more money was spent on renewable power sources than not, I don't really like the word, but energy sources called renewable compared to non-renewable. But the rate of power generation did not grow faster because they're very inefficient. Why is that? Because they've got a very low energy flux density. Windmills were excellent 600 years ago. Solar panels were great um, a billion years ago with photosynthesis. That's great. We had technology exists. That's wonderful. Let the plants do it. They're very good at it. We do something plants don't do. Well, nuclear plants do it. We can figure out how the nucleus of the atom operates. This gives a million times more energy than any chemical reaction. There's no competition. This is a chart. Energy and GDP for different countries. Maybe GDP is not a good measure. Here's a chart. More energy going to the right. Infant mortality going down. So when you say that maybe we don't need energy and we should live frugally, what you're saying is, mm, you know, maybe a few more babies will die. That doesn't matter. The important thing is we leave a good future for the next generation. <laughs> OK. So anyway, where can we go if we're developing? We can build a lot of projects. Oh, I'm going to wrap up here. OK, a lot of big things to build. One, one irony here. This is the Grand Inga Dam, um, which would be built in the DRC. It would create enough power for literally tens, if not 100 million people. Well, presently 100 million people. As industry develops, maybe about 20 million people. Huge opportunity here. Financing was moving forward on it from the World Bank, which pulled out because of environmental concerns. Apparently, people aren't part of the environment. What do we matter? Hmm? So if we're going to transform the world at night, which is a great way to see where economic development is, you know, what is going to make this transformation happen? Windmills? No. Nuclear fusion, the next technologies. Here's a simple schematic. On the left is natural gas, methane. The number at the bottom, 8 EV, 8 electron volts of energy in one molecule of natural gas. On the right, one fusion reaction. 3.5, 14 point, put it together, 17 MeV, million electron volts. Two million times more energy in this fusion reaction than in the chemical reaction. Why would you spend money making windmills a little bit more efficient? So this is, let's just, let's just um, talk about what, um, what we ought to do and what LaRouche's vision is on this, because I feel like I talked a lot about some negative things. So what is fusion going to do for us? It's going to let us have a mastery over space that today we can only even imagine or dream of. Right now, if you want to go to Mars, it takes eight months, maybe six months if you get the orbits just right. If you take eight months in space, does anyone remember seeing the footage of the, um, the astronaut where his twin was on the ground and the other Kelly brother was on the ISS for a year? Does anyone remember seeing what he looked like when he landed? How was he doing? Not that well. They had to carry him, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. But would he have been doing well if he landed on Mars and had to set up a camp? Was he in a good position to do that? No. No. You send people like that to Mars, they're going to die. They're, they're going to be jelly. 
So there's no reason to send people to Mars with chemical rockets. We just shouldn't bother doing it right now. It would be irresponsible. It's a death mission. It's just not going to work. If we don't develop nuclear fusion, we can send robots to Mars, of course, but no people. It's, a, it's, it's just death. It's stupid. What we can do then is an asteroid's coming towards us, we could move it out of the way. With fusion, we could go to Mars in a week. Then you'd be in shape, you could take care, you could do things there, and you could actually come back if you had a problem, instead of waiting a year for the orbits to line up and then another eight months to come back. That's not safe. We'll be able to power the next generations of industry. We'll be able to transform mining and materials. We'll be able to create steel without having to use coal anymore, which right now is used for its chemical properties. I'm not against using coal, but it's a little bit old-fashioned to still be using chemistry so much when we could go to the, the more powerful realm of the nucleus. <clears throat> so as uh, LaRouche had proposed in the 80s, he said that if we adopted then a mission of developing industry on the moon as the basis for then going to Mars to set up scientific cities and all of this, that we should expect a rate of economic growth that in a generation, the economy would be 1,000 times bigger. Okay, a 10 times increase in economic productivity. It's hard to even imagine what that would mean. Imagine being able to get new clothes once a year compared to how at least most people in the US are able to do it, get that more than once a year. Or imagine decreasing by a factor of 10 the age of the bus that you rode in or the train that you rode in to get here or the car that you rode in to get here. Imagine if houses were able to be produced at one-tenth the physical cost. I mean, just think about how much better life would be, how free we would be to be able to engage our minds in things besides trudging to work, doing a job that we might not even like at all just to get money to pay bills to survive. What if we were you know, advancing and going to other planets and able to be happy about what we were doing with our lives? So let me just read this uh, short quote from LaRouche to wrap up, and then we'll go to discussion. In the existence of mortal mankind, he writes, over hundreds of generations before us, and perhaps hundreds to come, what gives meaning to this tiny speck, which is our own mortal existence? What mission might we perform with this so tiny thing, our mortal existence, that we might look upwards to the heavens and say to an unseen presence there, I am happy, because I know that what I am working to accomplish makes my mortal existence a necessary life in the whole space of hundreds of generations before mine and hundreds of generations still to come. Can there be a greater happiness than to live in such a way as to know that one's existence is efficiently justified by the mission to which one's mortal existence is contributing? Security and happiness in our immediate life are necessary conditions to the citizen to which our Constitution's preamble dedicates the functions of our federal government. Yet, where could there be true individual happiness if all the meaning of our having lived were buried with our corpse? Do we not owe ourselves, our children, and humanity something better than individualistic, materialist gratifications? Is trudging to and from the securing of one's income enough even if the material standard of life secured so is better than adequate. To what higher purpose do we trudge so? Must we not be contributing in some way to building something which is good for the future? That is the highest mission of government, of society, of us, to make sure that, that becomes the mission of the government. Do we ensure that increasingly with the goal of everybody, the more people are able to live lives that they're able to knowingly reflect on and say that was necessary, that was good. I left something better for the future and I was able to live day to day knowing that I was participating in that. Isn't that better than a car? But we can have both, right? I mean, we, can, we will live well, but the greatest objective of adopting this space program is that we'll know that we're really doing something. That we're doing the, the human activity of discovering, of learning more, and of leaving more knowledge and a better society 
for the next generations so that they can further advance on it. And be thankful that we did what we did. Okay, so we're ready with questions. Uh, you should be ready with questions. Uh, and you just come right here to the microphone. Let me just say there are no questions that are out of bounds or there's nothing that is particularly not uh, something that we can talk about. I think it's important that we allow for any matters that are unclear or that you disagree with or otherwise want answer to be aired because the con concept is to move out of this uh, circumstance uh, very happily and aggressively to deal with this. This is not because we're under this problem, it's because this problem can actually finally be taken on. It's a problem that's been around for a long time, but it takes sometimes a long time to get in position to do something about certain things uh, uh, in a way that allows you to actually get at the root cause so that people no longer experience it as a kind of uh, conflict of opinion which is where the problem comes in. Just, you know, your word against somebody else's. But what are the principles involved that allow uh, all people uh, of goodwill to see why uh, something is true and something is not? So uh, the floor is open. Anybody has a question or comment, just come up and uh, go to the microphone. My name is Hyacinth Constance. Um, my question is, we know that, well, maybe not counting China, but we know Asia and um, Africa are not developed like the West. So where do they stand in um, the whole politics of what this is proposing? Because we know for a fact that Africa does have the resources of many of the things that go into our uh, cell phones. We know that for a fact. So where do they stand? And what is, and we know that um, the West for many years or centuries dictated how the Africans, the Asians developed. So where are we now, what are we proposing for them? And how are they going to be in this climate change as you like to call it because I'm sure Africa's hot anyway. So why are we saying global warming and a concern? So I imagine with the snow caps melting, it's the West who's going to experience it more than the Africans. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you go first. I'm okay. Okay. Well you, know, you brought up the um, underdevelopment in some areas of hot climate in the world, Africa is going to experience a great amount of cooling with economic development and air conditioning. <laughs> so um, that's going to be the experience of people, you know, in, in, in this part of the world, I, I'm, I'm going to say, over the next decades. Hey, look, you're right. There, this colonial system is really being ruined and taken apart now, and that's a great thing by initiatives such as what China has done. So there's alternatives now. It used to be you had to go to the IMF or the World Bank or some European lender to try to get financing. In large part, that's where countries found themselves. Now there's the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. There's the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank. Those latter two aren't as new, but they're expanding. There are new regional discussion groups. The FOCAC, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. Um, India, Russia, both of those nations are also holding fora to, for discussion with nations in Africa. Um, the ASEAN process is taking place in Asia. The peace negotiations around Korea taking place involving all the major players, all the, all the key players, Russia, China, the United States, South Korea, Japan, moving towards a peace there. So the conflict, for example, in Korea that was to the empire's benefit to maintain forever, this can now be broken. The financial control that was exercised through the IMF and the World Bank, this is ending with the AIIB and also Chinese 
uh, investment. So there's just a new world going on because it's not so much that China is doing something astonishingly magical. I mean, what China's involvement is very good, but it's the main, one of the biggest aspects of it is simply that it's not colonial. That it's actually a country with a great deal of reserves at this point, a growing economy, growing industry, able to work in other nations, that sees a huge opportunity. So most of the growth in the world in terms of population, economic growth, is in Africa and Southwest Asia. This is going to be the biggest area of growth uh, through 2050. And that growth is actually going to happen, unlike the growth that was suppressed uh, over the last 50 years. On the global warming thing in particular, this is a little bit of a, of a touchy issue. It's hard to gauge where countries stand on this. There's been a lot of money thrown around so that smaller countries that claim to be concerned about global warming are able to get funds from different UN programs to get essentially the collected sin taxes from some of the wealthier countries if they, if they go along with this. Um, China has been investing a lot in solar power. Part of this is for export to you know, silly people in Germany, but part of it also is for domestic use. And there's this idea of having a, you know, maybe a mix of energy sources being a good thing, like having a balanced breakfast. But among, you know, if you're having a balanced breakfast, you don't include rocks and dirt and, you know, motor oil. You include food. Including solar in your energy mix is sort of like making some breakfast for your kids. So you got your cereal, your glass of orange juice, and then you pour oil on the toast, like, you know, motor oil. You don't need that. Um, so it, it, it's an issue. Uh, Vladimir Putin coming out, he's made a lot of jokes about global warming, um, but he didn't take an action the way that Trump did in pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, which was a very good thing. Um, so that's what I can say on that. Yeah, we'll, uh, let's amplify the tension around the question. Um, all I did was, and this is something that you can do, uh, it's a practice that we have hope to end, actually, among our organizers, but it's a practice that everybody does. It's called Googling. Hmm? It's actually one of the worst things you can do for the human mind. But uh, so I just, I just decided to do it just to see what you would experience if you did it. So I just put in population of Africa in 2050. That's all I put in. Here's what comes up. Many consider... Africa's population growth a bit frightening. I didn't ask that question. I didn't say <laughs> fright about population of Africa in 2050. I just put in population of Africa. That's it. See how things work? So it's, it's important to realize what the game is about and how it works uh, because someone who could just genuinely ask that question will see this. So now what does it say? It says predictions place the population's, continent's population at 2.4 billion by 2050. By 2100, more than half of the world's growth is expected to come from Africa, reaching 4.1 billion people by 2100 to claim over one-third of the world's population. Now, Dave Chappelle would have great fun with that last statement, and he could probably do about a 20-minute uh, routine about it. Uh, I, I'm not a comedian. I won't purport to try to do a routine about it, but I'll tell you what it is that you see. Uh, the top five cities which are growing in the world are all in Africa. Uh, as Stuart Brand points out, and I just reference him because he's an interesting character, because he's, he points out that one out of every six people in the world now live in a city. And in about 20 years, one out of every four people will live in a city. He doesn't think this is bad. He says, uh, you know, when I was an ecologist, just a young ecologist, I thought that, you know, rural life in, in villages was, was really great. And that's because I had never lived in one. 
And he's, then he was, goes on to say, as you can see, he has a thing up on the, you know, TED Talk or something. He says, and, yeah, I talk to people, and what they explain is, no, they're running from poverty. They go to the city, and they're living at a higher living standard. The city is more exciting, there's more education, and they live better. Now, now this is important because you would think from American experience that the idea of people flocking to cities is somehow like a really bad, or maybe not bad, it's being represented as being bad. That's not how most of the majority, most of the people in the world see it at all. Not at all. They're excited to get there. So I, I, I decided to throw this in because there are some matters that I think, um, and the question is well taken. That's why I'm, 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 I'm taking it not in terms of trying to start a fight, but I intend to heat the room up a little on some of these matters because there are presumptions that we need to make sure, not that you, you may not have them, but you will run into them. Uh, I have a friend, I won't say who it is, who brought this up in her particular uh, company. And the people were absolutely, sh you know, we got to do something about that. So I, I happen to know that this is uh, the, and I'm saying this because this is the ugly uh, undergarment of global warming. And you have to get at the ugly undergarment to see what's actually being discussed. It's not even about money, although money's being used as an incentive. It's about something different. And I don't just mean racism. I'm talking about something worse than that. So I just wanted to uh, inject that just to see what happens. I'm so glad to be here and to hear Jason. Uh, it's very, very important. You are the harvest. I, I was talking with Richard, but the harvest of the basement, basement group. And today, your invitation to focus on the children, education, and young people is uh, an answer to uh, grow up uh, the, this movement. Because uh, we are in, fr in front of uh, the green propaganda in connection with the, the drugs legalization, especially the marijuana. I was talking with people because I educate people about uh, uh, nutrition and food. Very, 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 is very important uh, to pay attention. Many, many uh, young people are in a, dull, uh, in, in a conversation with especially with their mothers, convince them that the solution for sleep or for pain, headache pain, for example, is marijuana. Marijuana because now is legal, now is, is, is a, a medicine, yeah? And it's, it's a da dangerous uh, uh, Propaganda from the from 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 the young people in different areas, including in Colombia, yeah, where 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 the peace negotiation with the FARC group uh, accelerated the production, the production of cocaine, coca coca plantations and cocaine, and we must to prevent the the legalization today because we know that the bankers are involved in 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 that in that uh, purpose 
that's that's very important. The connection in the green uh, the the green movement and the marijuana blessing blessings for today situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, some of these things go together. I was thinking, you're bringing up drugs, like marijuana. It made me think about the opium war against China, which wasn't only to make money from China by selling, forcing opium into China, forcing opium into China, which the British did. It was also to get the Chinese op to become opium addicts. This is a deliberate drugging as a we weapon of warfare by the British at the time. I think about the number of people today using illegal drugs. I think about the number of people today using legal drugs prescribed by a psychiatrist or a general practitioner. The number of people who ascribe feelings of estrangement, depression, anxiety, not to external causes, but to a problem in themselves. Now, sometimes I'm not saying that's never the case or that these things are never appropriate. But if you look at the prescription rates on these kinds of things, how much of this is to be solved by eliminating the green factor? Like imagine a kid. They go in to see their therapist. How are you doing, Billy? Oh, OK. Um, I feel kind of anxious after I was in school. Ooh, anxiety. Oh, dear. Out of curiosity, what did you learn in school? That we're all going to die in 12 years. <laughs> Well, I'll just update your prescription. I think you shouldn't be so concerned about it. OK, so I mean, you're basically you're telling kids that we're all going to die, and that they're causing it, and that effectively, if you've got any sense in your head, what's the kid going to conclude from that? I should kill myself, and maybe other people too. Well, is it any wonder people aren't feeling that great about themselves? OK, I'm not that surprised. Um, you know, so as far as this, this drug thing goes, this has been promoted in the United States in a similar way. Soros and others, the idea is not just to make money for the banks, which of course the, the financial firms would love to. They say, hey, great, we can market this, we can make a lot of money. The same thing with the green stuff, with the Extinction Rebellion in Britain. Major ties with banks that are all setting up green hedge funds, green investment funds. They're, they stand to make a huge amount of money, but that's not the point into it. The, the main point with the Extinction Rebellion or whatever, depopulation, the main point for the promotion of drugs is to make people stupid or addicts. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a war on the mind. And um, so I, you know, it's important to say about, um, about those drugs, I, just, I, I couldn't not make the point about legal ones as well um, and these prescription rates. And then you know, the other thing is that there is no way that the best way to take care of your health involves burning something and then breathing it. So to the extent that there may be useful compounds within marijuana plants. Uh, I think we can do what we do with other compounds and plants, which is figure out what that thing is, and then create it after testing it and going through the FDA like any other specific drug. Not a whole plant that you burn and then breathe in. That's just not, do we have any other medicines like that? Here's some Tylenol, but to make sure it works quickly, please burn it and then breathe the smoke. You know, no. I just point out that one of our colleagues, Ned Rosinski, who's a doctor, will have an article uh, at some point soon about this. He's looked at the extensive recent results of the research on this, and he's concluded that there's actually no benefit. Um, that cannot be uh, given by another substance, none whatsoever, from what's called medical marijuana. So uh, we'll, we'll be presenting that. I mean, he just looked at a series of studies and so on. And again, it's not a matter that it's just a bunch of studies. It's also Ned, who has been with and around our organization for over 45 years, is very clear about certain matters like this. And this will be important to, uh, to, uh, to present to everybody at the point that we have it. But. Uh, hi, it's Howard in New York. Um, uh, I, I noticed recently that our mayor, uh, de Blasio, is purportedly running for president, but uh, just before he started to do that, um, the City Council of New York passed a law on uh, related to carbon taxes, this green thing, 
And uh, according to an article in the New York Times sometime in April, this would mean something like uh, for the, the Bank of America Tower on 42nd Street, that they would have to pay $2 million a year in carbon taxes, and that these would be extended. A carbon tax means that that even with all the, the greeny innovations and recycling of water and other things, that uh, this building has been uh, said to be uh, using too much heating or too much uh, air conditioning, more than it should, too much electricity. So that if you do use too much, then you have to pay sort of like, um, you know, your, for your sins, in this case, $2 million. And then the argument that this is on the rich, but obviously if, if all the banks have to pay these type of fees on their big buildings, this is going to trickle down to everybody uh, using banks. And, and, and that according to this article, also the, the so-called middle class uh, co-ops out in Queens and other places in New York would also pay similar taxes, which over, a f this was already passed, over a five-year period would uh, amount to something on the order of $5,000 an apartment. And, uh, you know, uh, over a period of time, would this even cause uh, refugees in New York, people who c could no longer live in their apartments? So uh, uh, what I'm thinking about is when I hear about this thing like this Extinction Rebellion is, is the purpose, since many of these environmentalist laws are phased in over one year, two years, five years, et cetera, is this uh, a mob to enforce laws which uh, no, under normal circumstances people would, would totally reject, you know, pay, paying five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 more a year after taxes, just to live in, in a place, uh, carbon taxes. And, you know, is this uh, Extinction Re Rebellion a, a terrorist movement or just a, an overall um, something of that uh, tenor or a note to enforce these policies, which, you know, some of our sweet looking Democrats, you know, uh, are, are promoting? things. So the Extinction Rebellion itself claims to have as one of its core principles nonviolence, but that doesn't mean you don't have an effect. I mean, think about it. If you convince somebody that factories are going to destroy the entire planet, wouldn't they have a moral obligation to do whatever it took to shut them down? <laughs> so I, I mean, you know, it's just like you'd say, oh, you know, what, what, like people felt that they had a moral obligation, let's say, to enlist in World War II. You're fighting an enemy. It's a bad enemy. It's doing something bad. Wouldn't you do the same thing to enlist in the fight against evil CO2? So does this have the potential for terrorism and violence? Yes, of course it does. Absolutely. I think we're seeing some of that in, in Europe. On the green penance tax, you know, it makes me think of, um, you know, let's say there's a, there's a village. And there's lots of land all around it. But for many generations, they've only used one corner of that land for growing all their crops. And the population's growing and they're kind of worried and they say, you know, we don't really have enough food for everybody. So first they say, maybe we shouldn't have so many kids because we'll run out of food. And maybe you shouldn't eat too much. You know, maybe, um, you know, they'll put you on a scale and if you're too heavy, they'll charge you an extra tax because you clearly ate more than you should have. And then somebody says, why don't we plant more food? Why don't we use all that other land and we'll have plenty of crops for everybody? So, it's almost this idea that we should just use less, basically be poor, accept being poor, instead of developing fusion to have ample resources. So it's just, it's, just, it's a fake choice because the choice is always presented to people as though it's not possible to, and you, you, you see it in the, um, the handout that you got that has the quote from the Extinction Rebellion where they say, given that we live on a planet with finite resources, there's no alternative but to use less per person. Since when are there finite resources on the planet? Or how do we know that they're finite? Dennis pointed out oil, petroleum. At a certain point, that was not a resource. It was a fluid. It became a resource when we could do something with it. Uranium. What was uranium used for 200 years ago? Pottery? Yellow paint? <laughs> making sure glass didn't look too yellow, add some uranium as yellow pigment to it. That's what uranium was used for. 
Um, before the nuclear era, it was used to make some kind of uh, high quality glass for electronics purposes. But then after the discovery of nuclear science, it's a resource. So we don't have limited resources. Resources don't exist out there. Resources are created right here. Our mind transforms a geological phenomenon into a resource. Our mind transforms a rock into a resource. So our resources are only limited if we hold ourselves back from developing new ones, which is precisely what we've been doing with fusion energy. You want to talk about a conspiracy of the government keeping something from us? So it's not just the government. Why have we not invested in this? Why don't we have it today? 40 years have passed since that 1978 study. We could have had nuclear fusion by now, most likely. And instead, we're arguing about ways to consume less and who to throw off the lifeboat. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Jessica from New Jersey. Um, I wanna thank you both for your excellent presentations and um, really getting to the heart of the matter, I feel um, you both touched upon that. Um, so in, in relation to kind of the heart of the matter, um, things that, that, that go a little deeper that usually don't get talked about a lot, um, we talk about the death cult and that holding us humanity back. Um, but just thinking about uh, deeper than that, what do you think the, uh, that there is the possibility of something else benefiting from this uh, or, or even feeding on this mindset um, that's been, you know, uh, been a top-down imposition on humanity from powerful sources uh, for a very long time? Um, you know, feeding on this uh, death mindset and the entropic mindset um, with the uh, restriction of growth and uh, the ability to think and project our creative ideas as humanity. So is there something else do you feel or does, has LaRouche ever discussed anything uh, deeper on that, that matter? Just curious about that. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, he's discussed the concept of oligarchy and a few main historical reference points for that are Zeus in the story of Prometheus, um, the ancient empires, Persian Empire, the Venetian Empire, the British Empire. Essentially, if you were trying to maybe put yourself in their shoes for a minute. Let's say that you, are, you run the world empire um, and you're trying to, presumably you like ruling the world empire because you're a sicko. And, he, sorry, you're gonna find it's easiest to do that if people are stupid, apathetic, if they believe nothing good can be done, if they think that they're miserable worms who deserve to die anyway, you're not really gonna have a new overthrowing of power in the world, the way that new technologies can overturn things, that can make development that otherwise couldn't have happened possible. So I, I don't think that, um, in a certain sense, this is almost like a last ditch effort, this pulling for just straight up kill everybody. At first, it was mostly used against third world nations. At this point, the British are essentially even doing it in their own nation, promoting this extinction rebellion, which has been, it's essentially been promoted by the government. Um, so I, don't, actually, I feel like I'm being unclear, so I should stop talking. Just I, the short version, I think, is oligarchy. Uh, empire benefits not from development but from keeping things back. And one person who exemplified that in its most barely, like nakedly evil form is Bertrand Russell. So Bertrand Russell gained undue acclaim as a philosopher and mathematician in the early part of the 1900s. He was a leading person in an attempt to eliminate creativity, to eliminate what makes us human. He did this in many ways, including, believe it or not, writing math books and trying to reframe what science is. And essentially what he did worked. People today 
have a hard time understanding the difference between what a human can discover creatively versus what might come out of machine learning, or the difference between a human creative thought and what a computer might do, or even of what the difference is between creativity and logic. So this is another very deep-seated idea that has to be overcome, and it takes various forms, such as, uh, I'd, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll add something, and Daniel may have something to add on this same track, uh, so I'll be short. Uh, the last element of what Jason just referenced is something that's going to be supplied by us over the course of the next weeks. And the arc of the next several weeks is that from July 20th, which was the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, uh, through about October 5th, that which there, where there'll be another uh, commemoration, or essentially, a, 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 well, October 4th will be the anniversary of Sputnik. But October 5th, uh, NASA is doing something around International Moon Day, and the idea that there are already hundreds of thousands of people around the world that have decided that's going to be a day where a focus on the moon and the development of the moon, industrialization, and so on is going to be made. So we have a sort of arc of time uh, over which we can uh, continue to advance focusing people uh, in the United States on what it means to investigate the moon. Akisha Rogers was out uh, from our organization, was out in Texas yesterday on the street organizing people and wrote, ran into a woman who had uh, two children with her, or at least her son was with her. And she said, well, my son wants to be an astronaut and my daughter would like to be an engineer. And so Keisha was talking to her and said something about, well, you know, that's the kind of outlook that will ultimately defeat the outlook of despair that people get involved with with the violent video games and the this and the that. And then the lady said, I'm really glad you said that because um, if you look at his T-shirt, you'll see why. And he had one of these T-shirts from the Fortnite, Fortnite video game. Huh? So Keisha said a couple things to him and so on. But what was important about the exchange was not that it happened but that uh, alone, but that it indicates something about the fact that he has an aspiration, but he's wearing something that's going to negate his aspiration. But he didn't know that. See, so the whole conception of what our campaign is is to allow people uh, to do what they wish to do by identifying for them why there are obstacles that they themselves are creating for themselves that they don't know they're even creating. And you, don't, you can't do this by lecturing people. It doesn't work. You tell people they're doing something bad. That, that doesn't work. You have to reveal to them that they themselves are often the architects of their own oppression. They, they, they usually don't mean to be that. So they are usually not only grateful, they're also often, of course, very surprised but that, that that's the case. So, so these, these things are not, uh, you know, there's an interesting thing. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche used to always criticize something um, about the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. He criticized the idea of self-evidence. He said, because actually nothing is self-evident. Now, it's in the Declaration that we use it, and everybody does use it, because it has a certain kind of... of uh, of, of usefulness as a phrase, and it also points people in a certain direction. But, but what Lynn was trying to get at is you can't start with the idea that any idea is axiomatically true. All ideas have to be subject to investigation and discovery of their validity. And, and, and that is uh, something that he has... Uh, emphasized because if you want to talk about what the deeper issue is, the deeper issue is to prevent people from asking the questions. That is what the purpose of all of this is. If you allow people to ask the questions, you will have natural human development and progress. And that is what all of this is about. 
Now, Dan, you wanted to say something. Did you? Yeah, I'll make a brief, brief okay, comment. Great. Hi, um, I'm Daniel Burke. I'm running for U.S. Senate in New Jersey, a LaRouche candidate. And I, I just think, I just wanted to, last week I came up and the week before to make a short comment, really where my purpose is to uh, encourage people to organize with us. And I think what Dennis just said is absolutely the issue at hand. And I want to, I was thinking a lot about my entree into the LaRouche movement uh, when I was listening to this presentation today because the deciding point for me when I decided that uh, my, uh, my, my normal average life, my comfortable life was not, uh, not going to pan out and that I was going to have to take a certain, uh, a certain leap with this organization, uh, it came when I was teaching in Harlem. This is uh, 2012, and uh, I was teaching at a private school in Harlem, and I was, invite, I was in, invited to, be, uh, to teach one section of environmental science, which was kind of funny because I had no science background. But I, um, I, I had a thick uh, set of lesson plans that the previous year's teacher provided for me. And they were basically looking for another science teacher at the time. So they said, well, you, you can fill in. You can do this. Just look. All you have to do is use the lesson plans. So I was following this along at the same time that I was reading LaRouche. And uh, I was very provoked by LaRouche. And I said, this is, this is something really special, but I can't, I can't really get involved. That would be too much to actually get involved. And, uh, and then I got a lesson plan that was written by the World Wildlife Fund. And uh, this is it. This is, uh, this is a genuine case. I, I should find it online because I'm sure it's available somewhere. Uh, the, the, the first instruction was to set up, set up uh, uh, right, right on, a, on, a, you know, on an eight and a half by 11 sheet, strongly agree, somewhat agree, strongly disagree, somewhat disagree. And you're supposed to put it up onto each of the four rooms of the classroom. And then you were supposed to lead a process of questioning. And the question was, is seven billion people too much? That was the actual question in the lesson plan. And then you can imagine the way it works, right? Because the whole way it's supposed to function is that the teacher gets up and reads the script, and then the popular kid knows that the popular choice is too much. And so the popular kid walks over, and all the other kids are waiting around looking, and then they see the other one go over, and then they start walking over. And now fortunately in my class, the, uh, the kid who, who, who played that role was also one of the smartest. And uh, we got, we actually, I actually did the, the exercise, but the kids ended up choosing strongly disagree. And uh, because of a process of, of actual questioning, not in the script. And uh, anyway, that was a point where I realized that I couldn't, you can't really be on the sidelines. You can't really act as though this is something that, like, it's enough that I have the right opinion about this. Um, and uh, so this week, so I'm going to share with you briefly that this week I went out to public areas in New Jersey, a couple of post offices and uh, location right near Princeton University. And I was campaigning with LaRouche Pack and telling people about my Senate campaign. Um, and I, if you get out and organize, you will see, if you don't accept the pessimism that's inculcated by the media that, and by society generally, that assures you that you can't really change anything and no one's really going to do anything. You know, and most, really, most people are just sheep. If you accept that, we used to hear that a lot from people who watch Info Warriors. You know, all that stuff. Uh, if you don't accept that and you actually choose to do something about it, then you'll find what I found in that classroom, which is that mass psychology on the basis of popular opinion is compatible by the use of human reason. That if you get people to think, 
as Dennis is saying, if you get them to actually ask the question in a reasoned way, then they come out of it. This is my experience on the campuses uh, with some of my fellow activists with the LaRouche movement. Uh, we went on these campuses for the past six months and what you find is that, yeah, a lot of people have a totally perverse popular opinion that they wear as a badge, but then when you come up to them and you, and you sort of say, well, hey, can I take a look at that? And they say, well, what do you think? <laughs> you know, do you actually think that this is true? Then uh, they will uh, ra rapidly, if you cause them to have some kind of a process of a Socratic dialogue, then they will come out of that. The vast majority of people that we met on the campuses did a U-turn and came to, to, to what, we were, what we were doing as an idea that they could uh, find, find their excitement and they could find some passion for what we were doing. So I just want to reference a, a couple of other thoughts on this. Yeah, I guess, you know, my strong, my strong point in that regard having seen the uh, evil cynicism, because earlier that, 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 this, that we're dealing with, you know, earlier I had been a school teacher in New Orleans, first grade, and in, my students had been, um, they had been one year old during Katrina, and so I had an enormous rate of, um, of psychological problems in my classroom. And on average, the kids were one year behind and they were in first grade. So they're already a year behind. And uh, we had a very, very challenging situation. We were in, in mass poverty, mass poverty that was, you would have, and you know, I can't, I, there's a lot, if you really consider what's happening in, in, in certain regions of our country, if you see it and you, and you care about the people who are going through this as human beings, you would, you would see what's happening. The children in this city who are going to school hungry, you know, who, who actually uh, depend upon uh, getting two meals a day at school because they don't get any at home. And in that school, we had AmeriCorps volunteers come in who were paid by the government and teach everyone about using the right kind of light bulbs, right? And that's the kind of uh, support that, that's what the government really wants for these kids. Forget your poverty. Uh, we need you to use the right kind of light bulbs, right, to reduce carbon emissions. So, uh, so that is, I think that's, you keep, that, keep that in mind, keep that really in mind, because what Dennison and, and Jason described about what, what's being done in Africa, it's, of course it's happening right here, it's happening right here. Uh, and I want to say that um, we should, the, the, the strongest thing that I want to convey is that if you, are, if you are pricked by the sense that you should do something like this, first of all, just get, get, it, get on board with us. Just come out with us you know, we'll, and we'll figure it out. But also at the same time, study LaRouche. Because the thing is that the, we have to use the concepts, the knowledge that he organized as an effect of his discoveries, use those concepts as your weapons. The concepts of energy flux density, the concepts of relative potential population density, the idea of, of uh, the new paradigm in motion that you're learning through being in contact with the LaRouche movement, the fact, you know, you got to use this. You got to go out and you got to use it. And if you use it, and if you use it with irony and metaphor and a social process where you're working with other people to make this happen, then you will find it works. Because there is a van, there's a, there's a subsection of the population that is defiant. This large part of the population is deeply concerned. This is, I'm generalizing from my experience in, the, in public this past week. Large part of the population is deeply concerned and a small but critical percentage are actually defiant and they don't want to accept it and those people need knowledge, just like Trump needs knowledge. He doesn't need, and you know, it's not, there's, nothing, there's nothing that he needs more than knowledge. And so we go out there with this 
And that's why I really want to encourage people. I'm going to keep on emphasizing this. Get involved in about th in the first week of September. Get involved immediately. But get involved in the first week of September where we're going to need a lot of people to get on the campuses in the first week of school and, and work with us to present these, these critical concepts and to wage war against the, uh, the green fascism. So thank you. Uh, well, one of the things that uh, I've been uh, reading up on the uh, moon, moon Mars mission uh, a lot lately, and uh, one of the things that uh, in doing uh, my own readings is that uh, I realized that after World War II, uh, in 1947, America started sending animals into space. And uh, basically, America sending animals into space is what ultimately created the Kennedy uh, space race uh, of the 60s, which uh, what created the, uh, well, the, uh, the first man on the moon was the sending of animals. So uh, 50 years later, we, we are here, but uh, it is a proven fact that uh, the space race did create a lot of the technologies that uh, we are using today. But uh, it is fact that America was always the first uh, to uh, send things into outer space. And uh, one, of, one of my major questions to, to get to it is, is that uh, through the 50 years of technology being the major part of, um, well, well, that's been influenced by the space race, is the oligarchy really behind the fact that uh, the English Empire during those 50 years really sort of lost their edge in technologies because it really boils down to America and Russia uh, creating most of these technologies. So is that really uh, the biggest part behind the pessimism? Because I see it all the time too. I mean, I, I'm very minimalistic when it comes to my phone, but when I do, I try to uh, hide in my experience on my devices, but I realize that most people are dumbing down on their devices. So is that really a part of what the oligarchy is about? Because I feel that they really, really lost when it came to controlling the outer. So that's sort of my question is, is that really where it comes from? And that's sort of what I, I got from it. Well, England definitely is not the technological leader of the world, mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, but that's not how they run things. I mean, let's put it this way. So uh, technological superiority, if you're fighting physical wars, that's pretty important. But if you can get other people to fight the war for you, it doesn't really matter that much how strong your army is. So the British Empire that used its navy to, I mean, the British physically took over India, right? Took true, over true, large true. portions of Africa. They had an army, they had a navy, they had soldiers, they killed people, they tortured people, they took control, they destroyed leaders, they said this is our place, they ran colonies. They aren't as strong militarily today as they were at the time of the height of the British Navy. They have a different kind of power though. It doesn't mean they don't have any power. Think about Russiagate. That's just one example. The entire thing came from Britain. Are there Democrats who were following that bandwagon? Sure, but to my view, the whole thing serves several purposes. You know, to try to throw out Trump, to create conflict with Russia, to create internet censorship, and to help the Democratic Party completely lose its mind so that there's absolutely no alternative uh, as well. It's, it seems to be what's happening anyway. So there's an example. They didn't need tanks or ships to do Russiagate. They ran that in a very different kind of way. So it's a different kind of power um, that empire has. Think about financial power, or think about the way that people develop their understanding about how the world works, or philosophy, or what economics is. You study economics, you're gonna read a bunch of British people. People who, I mean, the man founders of what's like considered to be the beginnings of modern economic theory, essentially work for the British Empire directly, for the British India Company and things very like much this. So, very much yes. 
So they've got this massive control, not through that kind of force, but through getting people to enslave themselves by controlling what is acceptable thought or what's taught as the way things work. So you get like this, this green crazy thing. The British aren't, don't have to send out you know, if some country in Africa is building a power plant, the British don't go down there with a naval vessel off the shore and like shoot rockets at it and blow up the power plant. They make sure it never gets built in the first place, either by making sure there's no funding, the by making HBA. people think, oh, this wouldn't be a good thing anyway, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, that's the modern form. Oh, wow, well, okay. Yeah, just, just briefly, uh, just to be clear. Yeah, there were, it's true, in the 40s, in 50s, but yeah, there was sort of a race between the United States and the Soviet Union. There was involvement of, you know, the fruit flies first and then the mice and mm -hmm. the dogs, the 12 dogs the Russians sent out, and then the monkeys and <laughs> all that. Uh, which is all itself a kind of interesting story. What, it is true, however, that when in 57 Sputnik occurred, on October right, 4th, right. Yeah, first order. then the United States took that as the opportunity to, Eisenhower specifically, to launch a kind of um, top-down mobilization of the American people. I mean, everybody was completely shocked. Everybody knows it was broadcast all over the United States. And within a period of basically a year, the United States was fully mobilized, supposedly, to beat the Russians in space. Mm -hmm. And there are many things that can be said about what that did and whether that uh, essentially began the space race, but that's the thing that is said continually about that. Uh, the British oligarchy did not have the same ability to be involved in that, uh, in that way. Uh, what we are doing, however, now, is we are uh, returning as a result of what has been announced by Trump. Because what Trump announced, you see, isn't coming out of nowhere. There's a 1999 interview that Trump did uh, with Wolf Blitzer. You can see this on uh, YouTube, uh, in which he talks about the, def the defense shield. He's referring here to Ronald Reagan's uh, 1983 st strategic defense initiative. And Blitzer makes it clear that that's what he's referring to because the Blitzer says two times, you mean the SDI. SDI being the Strategic Defense Initiative. Now, this was announced by Ronald Reagan on March 23rd of 1983, but the proposal was formulated by Lyndon LaRouche, and the paragraph that appeared uh, that, uh, in Reagan's speech, well, I'll put it like this. There, we were very involved in what Ronald Reagan said that night. Um, in the next day and two days that followed, uh, the only spokespersons in the United States on the Strategic Defense Initiative uh, of any note were ourselves. Paul Gallagher, in particular, who uh, sometimes addresses this body, and otherwise you can hear our statements, uh, who was the head of the, or operating as the head for the United States of the Fusion Energy Foundation, made several statements on this. But it was. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche negotiated with the Soviet Union for a period of two years on that, and that was not something that existed in the Reagan administration. It came from Lyndon LaRouche, and the day that it was announced by Ronald Reagan was a surprise, to, including to Defense Secretary Weinberger and others, at least that it had been announced. Maybe not all of it was a surprise. Um, this was a back-channel negotiation that had begun in 1981. Uh, LaRouche had met Ronald Reagan in, uh, this, in the early part of 1980 during the New Hampshire presidential campaign. There had been some discussions from that time. And then later on, uh, after uh, Reagan was elected, uh, there was an approach made to, uh, to Lyndon LaRouche through the United Nations Soviet representative uh, who uh, talked to our people in New York and uh, we, that was reported to uh, persons in the National Security Council, because whenever you get something like that, it means that there's a discussion that somebody is trying to have. Right. You, you, you have to know that. If you know that, then you contact whoever you have to contact, and that began, began a discussion process. And I think it's important for people to know it or to say it here. 
we so often talk about it, but sometimes it, it gets either forgotten or not placed in the proper context. Because we're not saying that to talk about how important we are. We're talking, saying that because in 1976, when Lyndon LaRouche first ran for president, the initiative of that campaign was to try to stop uh, the onset of thermonuclear war because there was a, uh, uh, a constraint because of the development of tactical nuclear missiles that were being placed in Germany at the time, West Germany particularly, the Pershing II missiles. Mm -hmm. uh, you, were, you were narrowing the attack time from 30 minutes uh, down uh, to as, as few as three to, four, three to five minutes. And, and it was known that in, if you got to that level, there was a problem of strategic miscalculation. The, the Russians themselves, the Soviets at the time, had developed the SS-20 as well as the SS-24 <coughs> missile, which was a rapid uh, moving cold start uh, missile, tactical missile as well. So the problem involved and the reason that LaRouche ran, besides the fact that he had economic development policies he wanted to go, go through, was that the danger was of thermonuclear war. He had people also in the administration who were very, uh, very dangerous. Uh, uh, of course, Nixon had left in 74 because of Watergate. Yes, yes. In, in August of 74. And Ford had come in, but Rockefeller Nelson was his vice president. <clears throat> and yes. the policies that were coming in the door uh, would have led to uh, uh, the annihilation of the planet, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why LaRouche ran. And in that context, LaRouche was contacted by various people, uh, including from the American military, uh, and a discussion around this idea of laser-based weapons began at that time. So I'm sort of telling this or uh, placing this in the context of what's called the space race, because there is something completely else uh, that began as a discussion in 76, 77, 78. Uh, and, and that's what our organization was involved with and that's what Lynn was involved with. And when you hear him, as you did at the beginning here, talk about the four powers in space and things like that, mm -hmm. this is coming from the arc of that policy. What we need to see now, because of course there's been this walking out of the INF Treaty, the Intermediate, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, a lot of people are very concerned, I think justifiably, but what Trump is saying now is, well, he wants a deal that includes Russia and China. All right, if that's something that gets pursued right away, that'd be very important. But what's the nature of it? So the nature has to take this idea of a new space deployment, joint space deployment, uh -huh. so that what you don't get is a weapons race in space, for example, which you could have. Um, and, and that's not something that anybody would find desirable, I don't think. Uh, uh, that, that was sane. Uh, and so there's a lot of going on around this green question, which may not be, is, and rather, is not what it appears. There are people playing games mm -hmm. around the idea of winning nuclear war against Russia. It's called pl prompt global strike. It's a policy that was announced in 2006, and it was a policy supported by the Obama administration. And what you're talking about in terms of cyber warfare uh, including all the stuff about hacks, is related to the theory that you could win a thermonuclear war with Russia, which is insane beyond description, but is nonetheless thought by certain people. So part of what you're looking at around the entire game of what we're talking about has to do with war fighting strategies <clears throat> that the Green New Deal and other things are partially covers for, because if you can stop advanced technologies from domestic application, Correct. in other words, if you take everything and place it within a military, now the citizens have no way of intervening. Whereas if you, for example, have public nuclear power, public thermonuclear power, in the case of fusion power, commercial applications of this, peaceful uses of this, now what happens is that this becomes the subject of widespread knowledge. It's not classified, in other words, okay? And therefore not able to be controlled. And one has to watch the privatization thing also, because part of the reason for the privatization is to argue for classification. Mm -hmm. Because the way it would be done is just what's well, a private company, it's, own, it's, we, we, it's our, our, our thing. We've got a contract with the government. 
So NASA's role in a re renewed space program as a public governmental body mm -hmm. is very important. It doesn't mean there's not going to be privatization, but it's just important to understand how the game is being played. So the British intelligence forces are playing a game. We know what the game is. Most people don't because we were present at the inception of this, this period of the game of the last 40 years. So we're doing something that they know we're uniquely capable of, and it's being done on behalf of the presidency, not meaning on behalf of Trump, but the presidency of the United States, of which he is presently the occupant. That's how we roll. That's what we're doing. And that's the way we're trying to get everybody in the United States to think about what we're presented with right now. Yeah. Very well stated. <clears throat> Hi, Jason. Uh, this is on the cultural side. Um, I think you were around. This was quite a while ago. Um, in one of our conferences in Leesburg, there was a 17-year-old who, a high school student, who had done research, a study for two years on the effect of music, uh, wanting to know, inquiring, how does the music affect the human mind? And he used uh, mice as an example, three groups. One did not listen to music, the second listened to Mozart, and the third to uh, heavy metal. And in timing them, the uh, group without music uh, gained a certain speed through the maze that he had designed, and the Metallica group actually regressed. At one point, they attacked one another, and only the Mozart thread that was being played did the group uh, continue to improve their times during his study. And I took to this right away. I, it was not a problem for me, but sometimes when I express this to people that are into this other brands of music, they had a very strong reaction. He was biased, the kid, like, you know, there's some type of duplicity or dishonesty on his part. Um, and then today, uh, kind of this just then, I see this on my phone and I wanted to uh, bring it to the attention of, see what you had to say. Uh, a 45-year-old woman was on a hike in uh, somewhere in, in Canada, uh, and only a few miles into the woods, she turned around and realized that uh, her and her dog had company. They were being stalked by a cougar. Uh, at first, she's intrigued, never seen one before. Then she realizes that this animal was approaching her. And she yells, and the cougar stops but does not retreat. Uh, so she's trying to do various things. Then she realizes that she's going to go into her phone and at the loudest volume she has, play Metallica. And within a few notes and a couple of words, the cougar ran away. <laughs> so is this a refutation of what that young man was doing? Is there some use then perhaps of Metallica? Everyone that hikes, I'm, an, I'm a city guy, so you won't find, catch me out there, but maybe this is something we could suggest to our fellow hikers. The, uh, the urban landscape and how this stuff gets used. Because, you know, if you go into some, there's some restaurants, they don't exactly, restaurants, where they don't exactly want you staying there all the time, like McDonald's, for example. <laughs> and so you go, and they always get, they've got trash playing, and it seems like it's loud. And I don't know if everyone <laughs> considers this stuff trash. I do. But I figure it's kind of like, okay, clear your table. we got to serve <laughs> someone else here. Although, oddly, then, the Port Authority, what do they do at the bus terminal to keep people from loitering? They play like classical music. music. <laughs> Wait. I think it's great. Um, you know, I did, I did, I read that kid's study, actually, and, uh, and it sounded good. I'd like to know if other people have done them, you know, just to mm. see if, you know, trying it again. I don't remember how many mice or rats he had, so, you know, it's just, it would be good to strengthen it. <laughs> he did it for two years. Two years, okay. Yeah, so. Because he realized after the first year he had to make some, mm. uh, break them up. You know, in other words, it was serious because he said, yeah. okay, I did one, but how do I improve it? One thing, he didn't want the uh, Metallica mice to eat each other, so he had to break them up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah, they use that at, um, you know, for, um, like, basically to torture people. Uh, to saw, you know, before, you know, what do they do it, uh, when they're going to do, right. yeah, Abu Ghraib or these kinds of places to interrogate people, you know, Metallica. I don't have a question. I just want to remind everybody on Sputnik 
That was an international geophysical year. I saw the American, or a model of the American Sputnik in the early summer down in Asbury Park. It had to be peaceful, so the Navy got into the rocket business instead of that nasty Nazi Werner von Braun and the Army, and it was a disaster. Every time the Navy rocket got off the ground, it was crashing to the ground. So eventually they had to say, all right, Werner, put the damn Sputnik up, and they did it long after the Russians had. But it was a wonderful year for science to work together all over the world, find out how flat the world was and everything else, and they did a tremendous amount of science move forward, everybody working together during the International Geophysical Year. And thank you. No, 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 you had to deal with this. Oh, Let me oh, just say a couple things about this, and we'll, we'll, we, don't, we, don't, we won't, don't mean to make this the close as such. I was about to close, but now that this has come up, we have to do a little bit of something. This is important. Uh, we, uh, we have a view of the uh, German space pioneers and what was done. Uh, we made it very clear in, on uh, July 20th, uh, and we spoke about Kraft Erika, but I want to say something about von Braun and about others who were involved in the Pinamunda uh, process and what happened. Uh, we're not going to go too far afield, and we don't want to make too much of a focus, but here's the con conception. The United States uh, and the Soviet Union, in the aftermath of the Second World War, had an, had an adversary. The adversary was called Great Britain and uh, it involved, in particular, the Socialist Party of Great Britain. Now, this is not, uh, not uh, usually talked about and discussed, but that's just the fact of the matter. It, uh, with the dismissal of Churchill, which happened almost right away, uh, I think it's Sir Ernst, or Ernest Bevan, I believe is the name, of the man that replaced him as prime minister. The socialists were the ones that upped uh, the decibel level against the Soviet Union, uh, particularly in uh, the German theater, uh, where you have, remember, the French and the uh, Americans and the Russians and uh, the British who are occupying Germany. The notion was to uh, make sure that there was no collaboration or as little as possible between the United States uh, and the Soviet Union who had been allies during the Second World War. Uh, many people were involved in that, and we're not, as I say, gonna go into all of this because it takes us way far afield, but I wanna just reference that um, the attempts to destroy Germany uh, from Robert Morgenthau uh, and others, uh, and Truman in a different way, uh, were resisted uh, by a faction of people uh, in the American military and some people in American political circles. Now, Operation Paperclip was several things at once. And uh, we were caused back in the late 70s and early 80s to get involved at the time that Liz Holtzman, or Holtzperson as we used to call her, from uh, uh, New York here began a campaign uh, to supposedly find old Nazis and put them on trial. And what happened was that the space program was one of the particular targets. Now, this wasn't new. This had actually happened back in the period of the 50s as well. Tom Lear and other comedians who talked about Werner von Braun and others. But actually, the people that worked in the American space program uh, uh, Best exemplified by Croft Erica, who, who was uh, a member of our foundation, the Schiller Institute uh, itself, and we talked about him. These people were given a mission. And the mission that they carried out, which was not just a mission around space, was a mission that was hated, was detested by British intelligence. Uh, and I say this because 
talking about the Nazis that were involved is a very, very slippery slope. Because what actually happened was that the United States, and in a different way, and I don't want to talk about the Russian program, that's something that really I don't know enough about to really make a comment, but I know what happened here. Um, I was caused in 1986, if I remember the year properly, to uh, go down to Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, Conrad Dannenberg was one of the individuals there. He'd been at Pinamunda as well. He was in charge of portions of the Saturn V program. And I took with me uh, about 90 young people uh, who were led by two people, Amelia Boynton Robinson, who was well known to some of you, one of our, our vice president of our Schiller Institute, African American, and uh, the person who basically brought Dr. King to Selma, Alabama, and a man by the name of Houston David Anderson, who was a minister. Uh, and they brought about 90 young people, almost all of whom were African American, up to talk to Conrad Dannenberg about the space program and about Pinamunda and about all these things. Now, there's a reason we did this, because those of us who met these people knew that they were not Nazis. Now, how do you say that? Well, they were at Pinamunda. So if they had Pinamunda, weren't you a Nazi? Well, you may have been in the Wehrmacht. And you may have been inducted, and you may have been pulled from the front, as Conrad and uh, Kraft Erika was, rather, at the age of 25, because you wrote papers when you were 18, 19 about propulsion, and then brought to Pinamunda. But these people, many of them anyway, hated what happened in Germany as much as anybody I ever met. Now, I'm saying that because once again, you see, it's important for us to realize that there are matters here of deep import that we are intervening into, and that, for example, Donald Trump found himself intervening into. I don't know if whether Donald Trump meant to do it or not, but when he came into office and said on the second day that he was going to clean out the 16 intelligence agencies and began to do it, all of this is what begins to come up. The true Nazis, the real ones that have the British flag behind them and wrap themselves in it. The real thing will come to the surface. The exterminators in India, the exterminators of, uh, of London come up. And this is something that's highly controversial and it's something that we are not gonna back off we are trying to simply say that once Donald Trump on the 4th of July reasserted his campaign around the Moon and Mars project and we saw the exit of the ambassador, the British ambassador from Washington, the roaches we call him. Once we saw that, we knew that there was a kind of battle that could be joined and that we are doing, we are joining this battle. Uh, when I say join it, what, I, what we mean is that we are now going to do something that we've been trying to position ourselves to do for many decades. But it can be done because you have somebody in the presidency who is inclined for various reasons to take these forces on. So with all of the imperfections of Donald Trump personally and of his administration in particular, with all of that, something is possible that has not been possible since the Kennedy assassination. So I want to make, just say that as a point of intervention because there is a deeper story on this entire issue around Germany and what happened after the war and what was done by British and American intelligence also conjointly with the forming of the CIA the way it was done in 47 by people up at Dumbarton Oaks which was done against American interests and against American intelligence. And it's important to tell that story, but we'll tell these stories as they should or they need to be told, not tell them as extraneous elements, but to point them out as we go. Because what is about to happen in the United States is that we are going to rip the cover off the real Nazis. And they happen to have been, yes, we should have allied 
with Britain at that time. But what Roosevelt understood was that he was not fighting that war for the greater glory of the British Empire or any other empire. Roosevelt would not have dropped the two atomic bombs. And the reason we dropped the two atomic bombs was that they, they were the only two we had. <laughs> now that wasn't done by the American people, but you have to understand something here. They were not dropped to end the Second World War. They were dropped to start the Third World War. So we just have to understand there's a, there's, a, there's a character of a world that we are privileged to actually um, correct and do something about. And so uh, I think what we'll do is we'll probably conclude at this point. I'm glad we had all these questions. Unless there's something that people have that's, that's urgent. Uh, you have something you want to say? Sure. Good. I was just going to say people should acquaint themselves with LaRouche. Um, we saw a video to open this presentation. We heard some quotes from another paper that he had written, EIR every week. And I know some people who read EIR read around the LaRouche papers. They read the other articles, and they don't read the paper by LaRouche that's in it. I encourage you, read LaRouche. Read Lyndon LaRouche's writings. Uh, the past two issues were a uh, parts one and two of a paper that he wrote about from 1988 about what the economic payback would be of going to Mars, as a, as a for example. But it's in the IR every week. Read LaRouche. Okay, so that's going to conclude today's meeting. We want to thank everybody and uh, hope that you help us get to work. <laughs>